stick around for my breakdown of the fabulous playing of the incredible Briss Wasi. Welcome. On this video, we're going to check out the king of the 6-8, the fabulous Briss Wasi. But before I get into it, make sure to click the red subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you're aware of every time I upload a new video. Briss Wasi was born in Cameroon, West Africa and immigrated to Paris, France as a teenager. Here's the kind of artist that he is. Here's something I found a quote of his. I play music, not drums. I'm still a drummer, but I like to bring my own tunes. Just because you're a drummer, it doesn't mean that you can't hear melodies and harmonies. Now that definitely resonates with me and probably many of you drummers out there because yep, I too am a composer. <laughs> so make sure you keep that side of your musicality going. While growing up in Cameroon, Bidis was exposed to a lot of American and French music as Cameroon was a colony of France and got all that music coming in. He used to go around the house singing to Otis Redding tunes from James Brown and, and Ray Charles. Understood no English, but he was singing his behind off nonetheless. <laughs> uh, also playing drums very early in his life as well. When he actually got to France, he was then heavily influenced by Billy Cobham, Steve Gadd, um, and Ndugu Leon Chancellor, as well as Tony Williams. Like, who's not influenced by Tony Williams? But Ndugu st struck me as interesting because I actually had a chance to meet Ndugu at one of his clinics, and he was such an amazing person, fun to be around and fabulous drummer. Fortunately, not with us any longer. However, his legacy lives on. Um, yeah, Bris became prominent, or made it in certain circles, <laughs> when he joined Manu Dubango's band. And he got, they had a hit called Mangambolo in 1981. And Bris is playing on a song, that song, uh, that is in 12-8, was particularly unique, and that proved everybody's era. Salif Keita got in touch with him, asked him to not only join his new band, but become the musical director. So they just put together the band, and they worked on the music forever. Like, I guess they rehearsed straight for a month, made the record called Soto, which is pretty groundbreaking, and was particularly touched me. as one of my very first records that I got. And on top of that, my very first uh, lesson with John Riley, <laughs> he pulled out that record and that song. It's the very first thing I worked on with him. And I was like, oh, this is what this is going to be like, studying with this guy. <laughs> that was something. Uh, but he stayed with Sally for six years and then started to play with other folks like Miriam Bikiba. Even did a project with uh, the great Jean-Luc Ponty, who wanted to do an African record, although Jean-Luc is more of a jazz player. And that sort of expanded Bruce's musicality into the jazz world as well. He also later uh, became a solo artist, creating his own bands and projects and production and also uh, his own records. So, um, what we're going to do today is look at a song called Inga Funk that appeared on his first record called Inga Funk, featuring Lanzana Diabate on balafone. And but he's also, I think, is singing on that. It wasn't clear from where I got the, the music, but I believe he's singing on that. And I wouldn't doubt it because he can sing along with his playing, regardless of how you know com complex it is or dense it is, beautifully. Speak about independence. Hmm. We're going to break down three grooves in the track. Uh, uh, one that's embellished, a transitional groove, and then uh, the groove that belongs to section B. Okay, so let's get to it. The first groove and the main groove feels a little displaced and it goes like this. So yeah, definitely feels, you know, displaced. If you noticed, I counted off um, 
with the click, and the click represents the dotted eighth note. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the feel. That dotted eighth pulse, uh, two against three, is very common in Cameroonian music and most of the music of West Africa, as a matter of fact. You can really tell when you check out dancing from the region. Uh, just watch where the dancer's feet hit and the body movements. They are based mainly around that dotted eighth feel. So let me play the groove slower. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two, two, three, four, five, six. Three, two, three, four, five, six. Four, two, three, four, five, six. One. When I count it and it's slower, it doesn't feel quite as displaced, does it? Uh, it has a kind of rocking back and forth feel to it between um, the first and fourth beat. Um, so there is also that same beat that is embellished ever so slightly that he puts an extra hi-hat 16th note on beat six and otherwise on the downbeat of beat six and otherwise the groove stays the same but when you play it it feels like a lot more than that simple little addition because you have to line it up with um, the kick drum just so to make sure that it feels correct here it is up to speed Yeah, even though it's only one note, it creates a whole other independent environment, I think, a little differently for that. Now, I think he's just laying that in there, you know. I think it's, he's just putting it in sort of every now and then. But that's significant, you know. Um, the other thing is, Brice is incredibly independent. If you look at some of the other stuff he does, he can sing while he does that. Now, I don't know if he's singing along with the guitar line in this one, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> He'll sing against any of the grooves he plays. It's really quite something. Speak about independence. Okay, so there's a transitional section that has a kind of groove slash fill approach to it, in my opinion. It's not really a fill, it's really a groove, but it's it's very Phil-like, this repeated pattern that he plays. And it sets up uh, section B. Um, and man, again, he's picking parts of the bar that make you feel very, very displaced. So if you hear that against the dotted eighth feel, yeah, pretty intense. Here it is slower. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two, two, three, four, five, six. Three, two, three, four, five, six. Four. So the, uh, <laughs> the last three notes of the last bar, you know, four, five, six. Four, five, six. When you hear it up to tempo, in the context of what's going on in the music, they feel like upbeats. It's really intense. Like the first time through I heard that, I was just like, well, what? <laughs> what is happening there? When you break it down and check out where the notes really sit, they're just downbeats, and they're at, he's actually marking out the 6-8 very, very carefully and landing on the 1 into groove B, which goes like this. Four, 
So that is a very, very quick run through of Inga Funk. <laughs> yeah, please watch it. Again, I'm a huge fan. I love the way he takes traditional rhythms and modifies them. No wonder Salif Keita and all, you know, all, Man Dubango and all these great African artists had to have his groove in there. He modernized African drumming in many ways. On top of that, his own uh, productions and uh, his own bands and projects are all really spectacular. Peruse his name on YouTube, you can see what's happening. So if you like this video, please like it and share it. Go to Aubrey Drum Lessons for more drumming info. You can reach me at Aubrey Drum Lessons to schedule Zoom lessons. Yeah, I'm still doing those because we are locked down <laughs> and I'm reaching out online and connecting with all kinds of folks. So make sure to get in touch with me for that. And lastly, check me out on Instagram. Okay, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching my video. Really glad you did that. Subscribe and click here if you want more performance and lesson videos.